The Adam Carolla Show presents Brian Kilmeade's Birthday Cocktail Party for May 7th. Let's see who's invited. Let's welcome 19th century German composer Johannes Brahms, along with 19th century Russian composer Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, the American actor from High Noon, Gary Cooper, the inventor of instant photography and the co-founder of Polaroid, Edwin Land. And don't cry for her, Argentina. Ava Perone is here. NFL Hall of Fame quarterback, Johnny Unitas. Drummer for the Grateful Dead, Bill Kreutzmann. American television journalist and former host of Meet the Press, Tim Russert is here. Hey, it's the guitarist for the Butthole Surfers, Paul Leary. American Daredevil and the son of evil, Robbie Knievel. And the representative from Florida, Matt Gates. Brian Kilmeade is on the Adam Carolla Show. Well, good to see you, Brian. Let me plug the book, The President and the Freedom Fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and their battle to save America's soul. Good to see you again, my friend. Thanks for having me on, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, let's talk about the book first. Uh, what inspired you to write this book? I want to move up in time. I don't think the Mexican War was good enough to get the viewers, uh, to get the readers. I thought that, you know, you have a few angles there, but I thought, let's move after Sam Houston, the Alamo Avengers, try to find some angle that is not plowed ground. And yet I know you got book of the year, Frederick Douglass with David Blight. I know this, the most written about president is Lincoln for a good reason. He deserves it. So I said, how do I grab the civil war in a way that's not going to make people's eyes glaze over uh, in a way that's not going to be go through the agony of the 600,000 dead, which is still unbelievable and thinkable. And I thought, what if I talk about these two great men, self-made men, much like a young Adam Carolla? No one gave them anything. No one would have bet on them at all, let alone to be successful in life, let alone be two Hall of Fame human beings that live on in infamy. And the good news for us and to me specifically is they wrote so much. One guy had a newspaper. Frederick Douglass had a newspaper. He wrote for the Liberator and then he got his own. So he, every thought is down there. Almost every speech is transcribed, so I really could hit the ground running without worrying about opinion or an author or a biographer and what they said and footnoting it. So I said, okay, they wrote so much. We're in a pandemic. Nobody's calling me. I can't go on any shoots, so let's do this. The uh, 600,000 dead, people have to keep in mind, I don't know what the population of the United States was. 70 million people? I, I don't I don't know. And Civil War times, Chris, you could look it up, but 600,000 dead is is a lot when there's 300, 330 million Americans. But you got to remember the populace was so much that by percentage, it was that much more devastating. 2,000 died in Afghanistan, and we are, we are heartbroken on that. That was a 20-year war. This is a four-year war. You literally were walking into a buzzsaw every day through the woods. And the more you read about it, you, it's unbelievable what we were doing, how it happened and how Lincoln did everything to avoid it. And as much as Frederick Douglass wasn't pro-war, but he knew the current situation couldn't stand. And it was amazing. He was half Muhammad Ali uh, and half Martin Luther King. So he was provocative. He was funny. He was sarcastic. He was smart. Uh, he was great on his feet and he would not take a backward step. Uh, basically since the age of 17, he was taking on all challengers, physically, mentally. Uh, you just got to admire that type of courage. I mean, Adam, they were sending, people are sending me pictures now of statues of him in Germany, in Ireland, in Scotland, and in London. Seven years after being a slave, he writes a book and then goes on a world speaking tour and he wows crowds where you would think, okay, I'm not coming home. Instead, he comes back and we're simmering here in a civil war. What uh, what do you think Frederick Douglass would have thought about today's world where Pete Buttigieg is calling roads racist and people are finding, you know, systemic racism in clouds? I mean, do you think he would have gotten on board with it? I know it sounds like a loaded question. Chris, I'm asking the population of the United States, not how many people died in the civil war. By the way, by the way, I said it. Thanks. 
All right, sorry. He's putting notes that told me how many people died in the Civil War. Uh, what do you think? How big is your staff, Adam? Uh, Chris, about five nothing. Oh, how many people do we have? Yeah. Because <laughs> Chris is really short. Okay. I'd say uh, well, we got about eight, ten people over here, oh. and then I probably got eight, ten people in the other room or the other building working on uh, documentaries and, and everything else. Oh. Uh, anyway, Chris, but population in the United States, Civil War? 1860. Uh, 1860. Yeah, 30, 31 million. That's it. Yeah, wow. almost 31.5. But Wow. Yeah. That, is, that is light for 600 plus thousand plus to perish in war but uh frederick Douglass, uh what, what would you think of today and what kind of guy was he overall in in your studies and research but put, put it this way adam he wanted to learn and he wasn't afraid to get into debate and he always say you know he was dealing with people that were subtly or blatantly racist but if there was something he could work with them on he would do it so you know you had this great people around in this william lloyd garrison this this great abolitionist and this other guy, Garrett Smith, probably people never heard of this unbelievable. Uh, he was a stop on the on the Underground Railroad, all, all in upstate New York, by the way. And uh, one in and, and William Lloyd Garrison in Massachusetts. And they were fighting hard. They, they knew the evils of slavery. Benjamin Franklin knew the evils of slavery. I mean, the the introduction, I went out and got quotes from Washington, Jefferson, Madison. They knew it was wrong. They did not know how to get out of it as smart as they were because they were born into this culture. They were they were fueled by this culture, obviously the free labor. And they said, well, how do I do this? And then also, how do I keep the country together if I got Massachusetts and wrote their interests and Rhode Island with their interests and New York with their interests, South Carolina with their interests? Well, they're, they're divergent. Well, how do we get the 13 together that become 18 and 22 and 26? It's 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 horse trading. And what they, they dealt with slavery, they sunset the slave trade. But for 20 years down the line, they thought it would be all done. But then it got reinvigorated again. And that's what we are upon, what was upon us then. What's amazing is that I think plays into the news where I don't feel bad going on Adam Carolla's show talking about history because it's news. I mean, you talk about education. These guys were told if you if you taught a black kid to read and write, you go to jail. If and Abraham Lincoln had two parents, illiterate, abject poverty. And basically, his dad would yell at him when he saw him reading. This guy would walk miles to get a book. So he just wanted to learn and would overcome anything to learn. And then you have education be the number one issue here right now. And I thought Frederick Douglass, I went and looked this up afterwards when CRT got hot, which is every day. Frederick Douglass had white friends as kids. And he postulates in his time, kids don't see color. And even the son of a slave owner, Tom Old, his son, Tommy, was Frederick Douglass's white friend his whole life. And he said, kids don't see color. What happens to us when we get older, when we see color? And that's why when a first grader is sit to told he's an oppressor or a victim, it matters. Because you have the, the all-time great American, Frederick Douglass, trying to figure out how these races got so torn apart. He's convinced it doesn't come till later. Why are we screwing up all these childhoods? But to your original question, I think that he'd be very, very happy in some ways. Like if you talk to Shelby Steele, he's on the back of the book. Shelby Steele says racism's over. He was a 60s activist. His dad, well, his dad's father, great grandfather was a slave. His dad came to the North. Segregation was everywhere. He goes, I look around at the progress we make and we're, we're done. We're going to just perfect it. We're done. And he can't believe how little and he's obviously black uh he can't believe how we're not even acknowledging the progress we made and there's other times that you know, you're really disappointed the way some people uh, might be thinking and the way we look at each other and we're still so segmented especially when it comes to elections yeah it's sad and and sort of poisonous i i do yeah. i do not think that the folks that are the race hustlers, and I've been talking about this for a million years, when you try to turn a group of people into victims, you destroy that group, or certainly a percentage of that group who buy into your victim rhetoric. Now, even if you are a victim, you are still hurting the people by convincing them they're victims. And if, if, if you, you know, everything that kind of works on the micro level works on the macro level. So if you're saying to your kid, 
hard work, determination, good grades, you know, uh, grit and all that stuff, you will succeed in the country. Well, if that's true for your kid microly, then it's true macroly. It's true for, the, for the group. And if you have a, a, every good outcome story that has to do with a kid that's handicapped, has a parent or parents saying, uh, we're not going to treat you like a handicapped kid. You know, you may have a legitimate issue. Let's not, I'm going to treat you like a regular person. You're expected to get your work done and do your chores and blah, blah, blah. Because we all know that the worst thing you could do with a kid who had a handicap was constantly explain how how their handicap was going to hold them back and no one looked at them as a real person and they would be discriminated against and have a very difficult life. You would destroy that child. So if that's your, and, and every, every parent, black, white, Hispanic, or Asian would admit that, all right, that would be the worst parent in the world, convince your handicapped child that they didn't stand a chance in life. Well, what the race hustlers are doing now is they're actually taking people who aren't handicapped and then convincing them they're handicapped and fucking them up 10 ways till Sunday. And, and, don't believe me. Just go look. Look at the test scores. You're fucking these people up. It's it's poison. I can't believe that CNN and MSNBC and USA Today and Los Angeles Times. I can't believe they're all in on this poisonous yeah. pill, this dangerous rhetoric that they won't stop pumping. It's so scat. It's sad and scary, but bigger. It's like there's a fiduciary duty you have as a politician or as a principal or as the editor of the New York times, not to fucking keep peddling this poison, but they can't stop themselves. I don't know if they believe it. I don't, I, I really don't know. Or they're just trying to get that a boys. I don't know if you have thoughts. Oh, uh, my, my goodness. Do I have thoughts? A couple of things. Didn't kind of Lisa Rice nail it a couple of weeks ago on the view when she came out and told four other people who couldn't believe she was saying that I come from the segregated South and, you know, we saw I didn't go to a movie theater until I was 18, couldn't ride in the front of a bus uh, my entire young adult life. But my dad said that's not going to that's that it's out there, but that's not going to stop you. Don't ever use it as an excuse. And I'm pretty sure she embedded those remarks because she became secretary of state, national security advisor and uh, the, the nation's number one Soviet expert. So I'm pretty sure she uh, overcame racism in the South. And she went on to say. I am not going to make, when it came to CRT, I am going to tell young kids, be proud of your blackness, but I'm not going to make any progress by telling white kids they should be apologizing for things that they had nothing to do with. And the minute you blame me for your problems, I'm out as a helper and an aide. Really, I'm the problem? What did I do? Well, nothing specifically, but apologize for being white. Really? I'm paying you $70,000 tuition and I open up a class apologizing for my privilege. Do you ever use that word? Ever hear that word more used than the last five years? No. The privilege of being white. Now, I know your story. Listen to you a lot. And I know no one gave you anything. You did not have the easiest upbringing. I don't, when I think of Adam Carolla's upbringing, I don't think of privilege. Uh, although you had the luxury of being white, which yes. is made it so easy. So I, I don't, when you make people take stock of the color of their skin, you're making us go backwards. Uh, it's in, it's insane. And, you know, I think people think I'm kidding when I say my white privilege is really not being in a group and not feeling like other white people will help me. You know, there's a real advantage. There's a lot of people who, when uh, President Obama became president, they went, oh, good. Now he's going to do something for me, for our people. You know, I mean, there's like literally people at his press conferences and things going, hey, <laughs> you know, 50 year old black woman would stand up and go, can you help me do X, Y and Z? Now, we know as white people, when Joe Biden gets becomes president, he's not doing jack squat for us. Right. There's nothing he's going to do. I, I learned that 
I'm not in a group. I don't have Al Sharpton as my leader. You know, Ted Nugent, he speaks for me. Ted Nugent's going to clean. Ted Nugent Ah. and Kid Rock are going to clean things up in my neighborhood. My real privilege is knowing these people aren't going to do jack squat for me. (laughs) I'm on my own, but that's good. I'm empowered. I've empowered myself. I'm not waiting for Jesse Jackson or Joy Reid or or Al Sharpton to take care of my business for me, who are, by the way, just making tons of money and going and doing whatever the fuck they want to do. They're not going to help me. It's that same thing. It's like, you know, the real white privilege is like, remember, OJ, he's dating a white woman. He moved out of the old neighborhood. He's living in Bel Air. It's like, good, fine, fuck it. I don't care. There's no white version of that. And there, thus far, I don't spend a calorie burned on that subject. I just go, my white privilege, knowing I don't have, no one's going to help me. And not waiting Absolutely. for something that never happens. Pete Buddha judge is going to make the roads unracist. How the fuck is that going to help someone living in the inner city of Chicago? Zero. Um, I, as by the way, I would love for someone to address the inner city of Chicago. That would be a fantastic thing. I'd be all in unless you're going to blame me for what's happening in the inner city of Chicago. Then I'm out. Uh, but I would love to address some real problems at one point uh, somewhere because I get up every day. I do the radio show, do the TV show. I just see the issues piling up. And this is an interesting tack this administration taking, attacking none of it. I can't even say they're attacking it wrong. They're not even looking at it. Hey, you got a supply chain problem. Well, stop ordering stuff. Lower your standards. Hey, we've got a problem at the border. What, excuse me? That's why I'm going to send the vice president to France to talk about Libya. That'll do it. So I just don't understand. We're not addressing anything. And we're going back and creating problems and derision. We're about the same age. Yeah, and we're exactly. I remember, yeah, yeah CRT. Uh, people say, well, you grew up and you never learned about any of this stuff. Are you kidding? I learned about all of it. Do you remember Roots? Do you think Roots was a <laughs> was a to salute it. to white people? I saw. I mean, that was the number one miniseries of all time. I you saw every episode. You couldn't believe it. I, yeah. th- I think there were, I think it was an eight part series, by the way. Chris yeah. can look it up. But the, the, here's the point. Well, and piggybacking on this. Uh, and you go, so what's wrong with implementing some policies, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong with implementing CRT or like what's wrong with teaching this or doing some affirmative action or helping, you know, lowering a test score, you know, okay. UCLA has, uh, too many Asian students. What's wrong with moving more black students into that? Uh, I'll give you an example of what's wrong with that. You just brought her up. Joe Biden is polling at a 38% approval rating right now. People think he's cognitively impaired. He's having issues. They do not like many of his policies. And obviously, if you're polling under 40% and you're 10 minutes into your presidency, that's a that's a bad sign. Okay, Joe is having difficulty and we're not a year in. Um I don't know if he's going to get to the end of the four years. And I'm not saying that as a detractor. I'm just saying that as an observer. He He's old. He has some cognitive issues. And they tend to speed up toward the end. And I don't know if, where Joe's going to be three years from now or two and a half years from now. Um, you chose... Because you needed a black woman or a woman of color because we did the affirmative action thing. You've got Kamala Harris. She's polling at 28 percent. The only thing lower than Joe Biden is Kamala Harris at 28 percent. There's a realistic chance that Joe doesn't get to the end of the term. I know the person who's going to replace this person would be the least popular politician of all time, (laughs) who by all counts is an imbecile and completely ineffective. And that person will be running the free world at this point. That's why it's important to pick the best person for the job and not just keep your eye on the social movement and progress. Great example. And how about this? I'll take it to the next level. What if you're that person you get picked knowing that he boxed himself in by saying it's got to be a woman and then he boxed himself in saying it's going to be a minority. So, wow, I got the job. But why? Because 
I'm a minority, I'm a woman, as opposed to I am the best person. So she's not even under the illusion that she's the best person. And that's what also could be damaging too. Well, that when you talk about these college campuses, they got to have a certain percentage of, of minorities. And that means that when those minorities walk around campus, people, they feel self-conscious that uh, the people think the only reason I'm here is because I'm fitting a category or I have certain type of uh, attribute, not my grades, but my attributes and my heritage. And that gives them a self of self being self-conscious. Well, a couple things. Yeah. It's called a presidential race or gubernatorial race. All right. Let's just keep race, not race, the color of your skin, but race like a hundred yard dash. What would you feel like if you said, um, all right, we're going to enter you in the hundred yard dash or the hundred meter dash with eight other people. Uh, but we've eliminated the three black guys cause they're men. And then we ah, eliminated uh, two guys exactly. from Sweden and then yeah. you get the gold medal. Well, How would you even that, feel that. about that? Like, first off, if you had a shred of dignity, you'd go, I don't want to be vice president because I have tits and melanin in my skin. I want to be the vice president because I'm the best qualified for the job. Like everyone should turn it down if it's based on your race and your gender. Number right. one. Number two, of course, people would feel that way. You love sports. I love sports. How would you, what would you feel like? What if they said, look, uh, what if the NFL just said, look, uh, some of these teams, the defensive side of the balls, 11 black men on the field. We really want to make sure there's two or three white guys on the defensive side of the ball starting out there, nose tackle, free safety, what, whatever. You pick the position, but let's just put a real strong emphasis on that. and We'll reward the teams that have a couple more white guys on the defensive side of the ball, and we'll penalize the teams that don't, don't comport with that. What would you think of those two, three white guys on the defensive side of the ball? Terrible. You, even if they were great players— you still right. look at them and go, well, oh, see there, because, which Absolutely. is the worst thing you can do to a player or a student. And those three white guys and put them in a minority status, they're going to be a little angry because they feel like everyone's looking at them exactly like you just said. So now they have a chip on their shoulder. So they don't even know why they're angry. They're getting an opportunity typically, but they're angry because they know why they're there. So who benefits? The people that did it, they wrote up the plan. They feel as though they're making America a better place. Uh, because they know better than us. And I, this is my analogy to continue with this. I think the average American, this is what the parents should be saying to their kid. The best you can, uh, government could, the best they can, if possible, level the playing field. Don't wait to score. Don't pay off the ref. Don't give me a five-goal lead or a five-goal deficit. Life is not fair. But if there could be a level playing field, I just want to be able to compete. For a long time in this country, I got it. For an African-American, it would be field was tilted against them, but they've scaled it. A lot of people scaled it and then they wanted to make sure to even it out. But now it seems like white people are trying to even it out because of what happened 200 years ago. And I think they're messing with the game to the point everyone's head spinning and everybody's angry. White people are mad because they're looked at as the oppressors and it's in the text and black people are mad because they're supposed to be victims. And I think inherently they don't feel that way. I don't know, you know, to what end, I always say. Um, Chris, you can find this clip. Um, the governor that just lost Virginia McAuliffe is his name, I think. Uh, Terry McAuliffe. Uh, yep. He was just giving some speech about, you know, uh, 50% black and Hispanic or 50% people of color. School, Teach school teachers. teachers are 80%. Yeah. Stop ringing the fucking racist bell every 10 seconds, you big sack of shit. You're ruining the goddamn country. You think school teachers? By the way, I thought the school teachers were heroes. I thought those were the <laughs> unions. I thought you <laughs> loved those guys. Now they're fired. Well, you're, you're basically saying that a school teacher who is white cannot teach a Hispanic or black or somehow the Hispanic or the black is going to not be able to learn because the person standing in front of the chalkboard doesn't look like them. And then how do you explain the Asians if that, in fact, is true? 
because I didn't have any Asian teachers all through grade school and junior high. I had a couple Hispanic teachers and a couple of black teachers. I didn't have any Asian. How do the Asians excel with nobody who looks like them on the fire department, in the police department, teaching? It's they can't stop with the racism. And then when you push back, they say, why do you keep bringing up racism? That's basically, <laughs> that's the entire plan. Why are you obsessed with race? It's insane. Well, that's what they blame. Suburban women went to Yunkin. And now they're being accused of being racist because they won with the CRT. They Because they went out against CRT and showed up at the board meetings. And they totally switched by about 18 points uh, that went for Biden last time in Virginia. Now went with uh, Yunkin this time. And all he did was sit there and listen to them, responded to them. That was not in his platform. Keep in mind, he was getting 2% recognition among Republicans when he began to run. The guy earned a victory, not by ringing the dog whistle, which should be banned, a banned phrase, by the way, not by ringing the dog whistle of racism in Virginia. What are you saying about Virginia, by the way? And now you're saying these suburban women flipped and decided to be racist for Yunkin and McAuliffe paid the price for it. And the thing is, Adam, I think you should feel better because I actually don't think the majority of people even believe that. When they say, besides the people on their panel on MSNBC and CNN, I don't think anyone's buying it. I just don't. No, I don't. I don't either. You know, when they talk about the Klan or they talk about QAnon and stuff like that. Jim Crow 2.0. Jim Crow 2.0. Most people have really don't believe, but it, it makes a bigger, kind of brings up a bigger issue, which is a small group of people who probably don't believe it either, but are making money off it. The race hustlers and the joy reads and all those people that they're hammering checks, you know, they have convinced a much larger group of people not to, who don't believe it to believe it because it's not going to be fashionable if they don't believe it. I feel like, I feel like the race thing in a way is tantamount to a lot of COVID stuff that's been going on, which is most people don't, they wear the mask because they don't want to be judged. They don't wear the mask out of fear. That is most people. It's a small group of people driving a large group of people who don't want to be canceled. And so it's actually, now when those people get to go to a voting booth, and they have some privacy, they're going to vote differently than the small group thinks they're going to vote. And that's what happened in Virginia. But you just kind of wonder how much of it are people that just are being led out of a sort of societal trend kind of thing versus people that are really down with the cause. Well, I'll tell you what, you are so much better equipped. I mean, the people that you're around, I lived in Los Angeles for four years, but I never hung out with the friends you had. But I think I was there when you were teaching boxing. I remember you had that boxing background. But uh, and the people that you're with right now, I, I'm curious that you hang out with m- many of which are very famous and celebrities. I don't. Do you think that they they would counter your argument that you just said that most people don't feel that racism is running through Virginia? And that is why Yunkin won and that America is inherently racist. And do you think they would come up to you and say CRT doesn't exist? I mean, these are the people who are your friends. I don't really hang out with that group. I am. I'm basically with a lot of my best friends are still from high school. You know, and I live in New York and I hang out with this group of people. I don't even see it. I read about it. But do you find yourself having just to be quiet around those people because they don't believe anything you just said? I think and I've. Never really thought about it, but COVID made me think about it. The number one instinct that people have, you know, people always talk about fear or love or lust or greed or whatever. I I think the number one thing built into everyone's DNA or 99% of people's DNA is they want to get along. They want to get along. And they're not saying get along like in harmony with their neighbors. They just, they want to be left alone. They don't want to be singled out. I've had, I've, I've conducted an experiment. Basically I had, I sat at a, at a, at a 
brunch table with a bunch of folks like you speak of uh, in Maui a few years ago. And somehow there's about 10 people, husbands and wives, all friends. And at some point, somebody started talking about leaf blowers and how they hated leaf blowers. And then I said something factual that I had uh, read in the LA times years earlier, which is leaf blowers are outlawed in Los Angeles. They're illegal. They have been illegal for 20 something years. I think since like 1998, they don't enforce the leaf blower law, the ordinance. And by the way, I'm in Los Angeles. They enforce everything in Los Angeles. Try parking with your bumper two inches onto the red, you'll get a ticket. They don't enforce it because they don't like the optics of it because everyone who does the leaf blowers are poor Mexicans. These are gardeners. They're all Hispanic. They're all, you know, living somewhere around the poverty line. And the super liberal folks in charge of Los Angeles don't like the optics of fining and busting and ticketing poor Hispanics. So they don't enforce it. All right. That's the explanation. So says the Los Angeles Times from 22 years ago when I read the article. The table filled with the kind of folks you're talking about, they don't know jack shit about leaf blowers or Hispanics or the Los Angeles Times. But as soon as two of them said, hey, man, I don't think that's first off, I think that's kind of racist. And then secondly, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Before you know it, I had nine dumb fucks talking at me at the table trying to shout me down. Now, wow. they didn't know and shit. And they your friends? Are they your friends? Yeah. Well, we felt comfortable, you know, getting into it a little bit. Fine. No bad blood. But the point is, is those people didn't know shit. I was the only person at the table that knew anything about this subject. (laughs) And by the way, you can use your phone and pull up the article from the Los Angeles Times that explains why they don't enforce it. But somebody at the table, sort of the leader of the table, thought it was bad optics that I was talking down to Mexicans or whatever it is. And they were joined one by one by one by a bunch of dumb shits who didn't know fuck about this subject. But they were united voice. So here's my point. Did did it was me, another guy, and maybe eight other people that all took his side. Did they ever have any thoughts about Hispanics and leaf blowers and L.A. County and enforcement of laws before we sat down at brunch? No, they didn't have a thought in their head about it. Did they have any information? No, they had no information. They zealously jumped onto this person's side because they're weak number one, but number two, because they want to get along. And it was clear the direction of the table was moving that direction. I was the outlier at the table. I was not the popular one at the table. We were not moving my direction. There was a couple of dumb wives in the mix. They don't know anything about fucking leaf blowers or anything. They were all as vocal as this guy was. All of a sudden, they, they somehow knew this subject very well. They didn't know jack shit. They wanted to get along and they knew which direction the table was moving. So they moved that direction with the table with zero information. Now, why did they do it? Because it's a human instinct to try to get along. And I feel like COVID has illustrated the shit out of this for me. I see so many dumbasses just wanting to get along and not wanting to be hassled and jumping on board with no goddamn information. I've seen the same thing. Look, Black Lives Matter cropped up a year and a half ago. How many dumb shits just jumped on board with that? They just every, want to every get organization. Along. Every organization. Yeah, people, every organization, they got zillions of dollars and the leaders are all gone. They just wanted to get along. So, how many people really believe in leaf blowers or citations or Mexicans and leaf blowers? How many? None. How many want to get along? All of them. And that's how you end up where we're at. Right. So (laughs) I I had no idea when I did this, I had a clue that race would be a big deal. Uh, When I got this thing, it was before Black Lives Matter, before the pandemic, when I got the deal, it took two years and two months. But the more I was doing this, the more I realized I have to put more and more quotes in this book because I don't want people to have my 
think it's my opinion on what Frederick Douglass thought. I'm telling you, he wrote everything down. Lincoln wrote every speech, every speech was transcribed and put in papers. So you'll see how he viewed race at the time. And his remarks were now that basically to summarize, now that you're free, now that you've earned your freedom, you have your freedom. It doesn't mean you have to stop working hard. Go show you earned it. Lincoln's comments when he goes to Richmond after Jefferson Davis uh, leaves and runs, he goes, send me to Richmond. I want to see where this guy lived. I want to go see these people. And he goes with his son and all these African-Americans look at him as the Messiah. He just changed everybody's life. He changed the world. And to paraphrase his last speech, which was in the special on Sunday, he said, you've never you've never should have had your liberty taken away. Now show the world you earned it and deserve it and keep it. And I think that everyone should have that universal thought. Don't tell me your circumstances. Don't tell me how your parent was an alcoholic, single parent family. We had no money. I was ignored. I was the kid that got no attention. I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get to the school. Well, whatever it is, make it your story. Author a success story or do what you can. The only thing people can't take away is your opportunity to work for success. The work ethic and the effort matters. The only thing I disagree with Bill Parcells on is he wrote a book, No Medals for Trying. I think if we had a country trying, sooner or later, we're going to be a country breaking through and getting some degree of success and the pride knowing you earned it, despite your adverse uh, your uh, tough circumstances, not guaranteeing it, just earning it. And that's why I'm embarrassed. There's 10 million jobs open. I think that relates back to the book, too. How could there be 10 million jobs open and 7 million people without a job? Yeah. That doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. All right. Well, speaking of jobs, let me hit a quick spot here before we go on. Blinds uh, really? galore. Oh, yeah, I got a job to do. More than a hardware store blinds aisle. You don't want to muss with that. Now, blinds galore. They are experts, family owned and run by mother daughter team for over 20 years. Covered over 2 million windows and counting 100% custom window treatments built to your exact measurements down to every little detail. Nothing gets made until you order it. I have these in my home, in my bedroom, the ones in my bedroom. Charge them up once a year, maybe twice a year. They're electronic. You can hook them up to your phone. You can hook them up to your Alexa device. Uh, not only do you get uh, brand new window coverings that fit perfectly, but they'll look like they belong in your home. BlindsGalore.com. You can order right from your home. Their experts are standing by to help you at BlindsGalore.com. Right, Dawson? BlindsGalore.com makes it easy to get the high-quality designer blinds and shades you've always wanted in your home, all at a great price, all at up to 45% off. See for yourself at BlindsGalore.com and let them know that we sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com. All right, we'll take a quick break. Come back with Brian Kilmeade right after this. Every 60 seconds... Not one, but two children are trafficked. And every 30 seconds, one is forced into exploitation for the purpose of heinous acts. Human trafficking is happening in your own backyard. It is happening to your neighbors. Many whom we see every day in our own communities hidden in plain sight. You know, there's kids out there that are being bought and sold 20 times a day. We must bring the child back to the center of our care and concern. And today we launch Goya Cares. Goya Cares is committed to supporting victims and overcomers of trafficking and abuse to recover, restore, reconnect, and to shine the light that will block traffic. This is where we become the light. God saved me. I believe that I was called to this. Perhaps he's calling you to block traffic. Join Goya Cares and visit blocktraffic.org. All right, back with Brian Kilmeade, the book, The President and the Freedom Fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and their battle to save America's soul. It's available now on Amazon. Um, I want to talk about your stand-up career. I've been up on stage with Brian. He's very good on his feet. I don't think people know that side of him. So I want to talk about your stand-up and stand-up in general, uh, first, as promised, there's the Terry McAuliffe uh, thing. I think this is, yeah, right before the election where he's talking about uh, schools teachers. and teachers and what percentage. It drives me insane when people talk about the fire department needs to represent the community. No, you just need a fucking fire department that's competent. 
That's all <laughs> fucking racist. It drives me nuts. All right, here he is. Sack of shit. Glad he's gone. Here we go. I promise you, we've got to diversify our teacher base here in Virginia. 50% 50 50 of the students at Virginia schools, K-12, 50% are students of color, and yet 80% of the teachers are white. We all know what we have to do in a school to make everybody feel comfortable in school. So let's diversify. By the way, if you can't feel comfortable in front of people who look different than you, you have to leave the United States because <laughs> that's all we have. Right. Sweet. That's all it is. You go. Oh, you know what their biggest shitty lie is? Scared of people who look different than them. It's so disingenuous. It's so cloying. It's such a lie. You cannot get along in the United States if you are scared of people that look right. different than you. Oh, it's 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 poison. It and they do it with a straight face and they don't get called out enough. A couple of things on this. On that statement, he's supported by the teachers unions, right? Public schools. So since when did he just called out the teachers unions? Does he even know that? Are they no. only hiring white teachers? I don't know. In Virginia, do you know they pay terribly in Virginia? There's not a lot of people lining up to be teachers. If there was African Americans not allowed to be teachers by some secret list that nobody knew about. He might be addressing an issue. But as far as I know, no minorities are boxed out of teaching. And what you said fundamentally is true is that since when do you have to be taught by somebody who looks like you? All we want to teach by Americans who want to teach us how to know stuff we don't know yet. And here's the worst part. He's telling people we got to change our schools, got to make schools for Virginians. All his kids went to private school. So he's paying huge tuition. So he thought that schools were so good the way they were before, they wouldn't even send his own kids there. He's got four kids. I think three of them went to private school. So he's such a hypocrite. Then he appears with Randy Weingartner at the end of a uh, popular person on the planet to lock it out. I, I thought he was throwing the election. Uh, bringing that shrew up on stage <laughs> who just makes my eyes water when she opens her mouth as a fucking teacher's union shill who's pulling the strings with the CDC trying to set policy. Imagine the shrew who runs the teachers unions is dictating policy to the CDC about COVID. It's insane why you would bring that person up. The, the least likable person since Joey, but on the goddamn yes. planet and have her cackle into microphone on your behalf is insane. And it just shows how insanely out of touch he is. All right, let's talk about uh, stand up. You must, uh, as a former stand up, you must have uh, some thoughts about the, the Chappelle subject and which way the wind is blowing. I feel there's a little bit of a shift going on in the comedy community. I was screaming for the last year and a half where are the comedians? Where are the comedians? Why aren't they talking more about lockdowns and overregulation and oppression? And where are the comedians feel like they're starting? Bill Maher starting to come around. Of course, there's the Dave Chappelle. I mean, they're it's starting to shift. If you notice that. Absolutely. Uh, there, there's certain things. I mean, when I was uh, I think, you know, Chris Mazzilli with Gotham Comedy Club. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's and that's Seinfeld's favorite comedy club. So I went in um, in the 80s, 86. I thought the one thing before you got your there was a thing called podcast where you could really hop on or social media. Stand up was the best way for me to be able to get on stage, even if it's six o'clock in a diner. No one could tell you, no, you have to wait for that acceptance call to come in and say, come on and be my sportscaster. So that would be a great way to be better on your feet, better memorizing, which clearly I had to do. So I was doing that, but I went to those comedy classes to get started, to learn how to, to do it. Because from a background, I just, I'm not like the artist type where I wait for things to motivate me. I need a structure. All right, I got to go to class every Saturday, prepare this many jokes in order to perform at the end. So I was getting kind of organized in that way. But I had a chance to hook up with the guys at Catch Rising Star, and they opened up on the West Coast. And they tried something at Universal for a very short time. You mm -hmm. were probably out there already. Yeah. So I was doing some sales with them and some stand up with them, waiting for something to break through, end up getting a sports job and coming back here. Uh, but I always wanted to see what I could do in that, uh, because it, to me, it's still the most rewarding and difficult thing you can do, period. I don't know if you feel the same way as much as you like uh, you can talk your way through this. But if they, when you get up in front of a bunch of strangers and you're not funny right away or you don't have a good rhythm, 
you I think you're the most exposed. But I'm astounded because growing up, it was so easy to pick out what you wanted to do. You had Johnny Carson was the best ever. Letterman was the edgiest. And then, you know, you had all these other guys, but they were funny. They were equal opportunity offenders. Whenever you think of Jay Leno, he would be hitting the right and hitting the left. You could relax and take in the comedy. I watch Saturday Night Live right now, and this is it's it's like an advocate. They're advocates for the left. When you see obvious ways to mock Joe Biden, they're actually trying to save Joe Biden in their cold open rather than take him out like they would Reagan or Bush and well as Will Farrell did as they try to do with Trump every week. So to me, stand up has totally let me down. You know who hasn't is Bill Maher. I've listened to him for the last probably six or seven months. His monologues sound like something Tucker Carlson would put in his teleprompter. He's expressing outrage, not at the issues about the ridiculous stance people are taking who just want to live their lives. And they they want to bridge too far with Dave Chappelle's impervious. Not only is he rich and famous, but he is cutting edge. So you're going after him on a stand-up. You should expect stuff like that on stand-up. And if you are tra- in the trans community, or you are in the LGBT, whatever it is, you can't laugh at yourself by a guy that has no biases. He just wants to make people laugh. Don Rickles wouldn't last one day today. Literally, you'd have to apologize the next day or he'd be radioactive. Be radioactive. You couldn't book him because he if you look at his stuff from the 70s or you look at that stuff from the, the roasts. Oh, my goodness. That wouldn't last one day. Reagan hosted one of those roasts. He was roasted one day by all these people. The horrible things they said about him were absolutely hysterical. All of it are, are third rail right now today. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm very curious to see now that everyone could go back into crowds to clubs, vaccinated or unvaccinated, uh, of people going to be courageous. I, I just I respect State Farm for standing by uh, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. That was one of the first times I've seen somebody in corporate media refuse to cancel somebody who, by the way, did nothing wrong. Yeah. Corporate America. Yes, I agree. I I know it's, it's sad. It's sad that it's astounding that this corporation stood behind somebody they have a great relationship with. It's sad that that's so surprising to us because you thought that he would be canceled for giving his opinion. And obviously I say it all the time, but People never stop talking about McCarthyism in this town, and they want everyone canceled who speaks their mind or has an opinion that's different than their own, which is the height of hypocrisy, and it's also insane. And it's such a weird time we're living in. And the the, the only way to defeat it is people stop apologizing. You got to go Dave Chappelle, or you got to go State Farm, and you have to stand by... People, that, but by the way, it's it's none of anyone's business. This is my bigger picture, which is nobody thought it was any of their business to tell a comedian what he or she could or couldn't talk about ever until about the last 10 minutes in this country. And by the way, that went with vaccinations or anything else. It is none of your goddamn business. Aaron Rodgers his deciding to go a different route other than the Vax route with the help of folks that he respects and consults like his physician and Dave Chappelle yeah. wants to talk about transsexuals. It's none of my goddamn business. That's their business. Absolutely. And I have no say in it. And I would never think that I should have a say in it. This is the new era. Everyone thinks they have a say in someone else's business. If you have a nine-year-old and you don't want that kid vaccinated, it's none of my goddamn business. If you have a nine-year-old and you want to get them vaccinated, it's none of my goddamn business. What they say is, well, if you are eight times more likely to get it and spread it, if you get it, I go, really? Where'd that stat come from? What do you mean? Where did that stat come from? Who, who came up with that stat? That if you if you're not vaccinated, it's easier for me to get it and spread it. Well, if it's easy for me to get it, that's my decision. It's easy for them to spread it. I have not seen anybody to have produced a stat like that. So it, it's up to me. And if if you really if you want to get into the vaccination conversation, which we have every day, the mandate mania what we're witnessing, I refuse on the show to give medical advice to people because I keep checking my diploma. I don't have any medical background, and I don't be responsible. 
I got two 17 year old kids that I know, one of which I coached, that took the vaccination for college, they're soccer players, and they got the swelling of the heart and they can't exert themselves for six months. These are fine tuned teenage athletes, college soccer players who got a vaccination they didn't need. Now, what if they came to me and I urged them to get a vaccine? How do you think I would feel right now? I refuse to do it. Aaron Rodgers researches everything. He's meticulous. The guy can not only host Jeopardy, he could win Jeopardy. If you watched him play, by the way, I met him. He's not the warmest guy, so I'm not going to bat for him. So if you watch him play, he's a genius on the field. So he went and did this. He did his research. He actually had answers, and he said the league knew. People are madder at him than they are the wide receiver for the Los Angeles Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders, that killed somebody going 165 miles an hour, drunk with a gun in his car. But Aaron Rodgers is the problem. Why is that? Well, it's getting back to Dave Chappelle talking as about his baby thing, you know. They're, he killed someone at a Walmart, I guess, and they're more angry at him for the anti-gay slurs he spat out on stage. That's the new world we're living in. And there's, there is no satiating this group other than to tell them to shut the fuck up. That's all we have. There's no more backpedaling. There's no more apologizing. I've been saying this for years. It's the only way that this stops. It'll stop the day people stop backpedaling and apologizing. But, but Adam, they're always going to go for you, right? They're going to look for you. They're going to look for Joe Rogan, right? i look for anyone on Fox. I'm not yeah. complaining. But when it, what's going to get their attention is when it starts boomeranging and they start shooting their own. You know, um, when things then they when people on the left start being viewed as politically incorrect for something they may or may not have said, and suddenly they're canceled, then they realize they overshot the target and they're blowing themselves up. The hand grenade was pulled and now they're getting exploded. Well, you're the one who started it, and now it's blowing up on you. And and that we're seeing this over and over again. Well, I don't know that there's any I there's zero pump the brakes. It's literally sane America must stop cowering and stop apologizing. And it's a self-preservation and the get along gene I was talking about that has washed over this country. I've, you know, I've never heard more people. I do a podcast with Dr. Drew. Um, He's great. Yeah. I love it. What you do with your physician, you consult with your physician. Maybe he wants you to take ivermectin. Maybe he wants you to take hydroxychloroquine. That's between you and your physician. It has <laughs> nothing you. to do with me. It has nothing to do with Tucker Carlson. It has nothing to do with Joy Reid. It is just between you and your physician. That's it. That's, and now we've gotten to this place where it's insane. But, you know, Drew is saying for the first time ever, you know, he's calling pharmacists and wanting hydroxychloroquine and they want to know what it's for. That's not wow. that's not the place we want to be. You just want it to be between you and your physician. And we're getting into some scary territory here where phar pharmacists are having physicians explain to them what they're going to do with the with the order they called in. That's not that's not a good place to be as a country. Nobody should want to live there, right or left. Nobody should want to live in that country. And we're there and we're going there. Uh, it's, it's not good. I don't. Well, I have a question yes. for you, Adam. Have the change, has it changed anything you've said? I know you've been attacked. You're aggressive on uh, social media sometimes. Has it changed you at all? The pushback or the what have you? Yeah. Like, have you, have you edited yourself a little bit? Not really. No, I think you've probably judged by the last 52 minutes of our conversation. I didn't think so either. Uh, listen, yeah. I've, I've told everybody, you know, first things first, I, I'm a comedian and I have opinions and that's it. I'm not even saying what's right, what's wrong. This is what I think. I'm a yes. comedian. I'm allowed to say what I want to say as a comedian. And the day you give that up, eh, that's the day I go back to carpentry. Like, uh, why, why be a comedian if you can't give your opinion or you have to alter it or shape it or fit it into some mold or some template that's going to be more palatable for the next cocktail party or whatever it is? Uh, 
not interested. I'm an atheist who became a comedian. I only did those two things so I could say whatever I want to say. And, and that's it. And I have, you know, it, it's not always helpful. I'm not saying it's a, it's a, you know, a journey to success, but I, I will, I will tell you this, the folks that have tried to sort of squash and silence folks that they disagree with are inadvertently creating a much more powerful opposition to them. It's essentially you try to boycott Chick-fil-A and Chick-fil-A has the best yeah. quarter ever. I know. You try to squash Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan gets more popular. You try to squash Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle gets more popular. You try to squash Fox News, Fox News gets more popular. You try to squash Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, the Daily Wire gets bigger. Yeah. These people are creating something that they don't want by trying to over-regulate and over-police folks that don't want to be policed. It's, uh, that's what just happened in Virginia. They created this guy with 2% recognition a year ago into the governor of Virginia because they tried to over-police. They're, they don't yeah. understand tactically what they're doing. What they're doing is the exact same they, thing they did with Chick-fil-A. Lieutenant Governor, African-American, military, from Jamaica. I believe Jamaica or Haiti. I forgot which one. My bad. But she is now the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and she's obviously black. And all she cares about is, I love this country. I can't believe the opportunity I had. And now I'm just trying to help as many other people as possible. And nobody even writes about the success of the first black female lieutenant governor of Virginia. That's not a story, but it doesn't mean she's not going to be huge. She's not going to be big. And what I found too, I've been on this book tour for about six days. I probably saw 2000 people. And most people say, I just keep my, I haven't changed any of my beliefs. I just keep my mouth shut. I keep it in my family, keep it in my house. I don't even bring my opinions to work, but I haven't changed my opinions. And that's why these polls are always going to be wrong. You force people to keep their opinions to themselves but they're not changing their opinion, but they're not dealing with people that may judge them or disagree with them, which makes things kind of worse. But I think that's why in, President Biden has done things so horrendously. So refusing to deal with any issue, just going on his agenda, I've never seen anything like it. That's why in 2022, barring anything unforeseen, you are going to see a rout of routes because people are fed up, even non-Republican conservatives, People are fed up. And this vaccine has alienated minorities. It's mostly minorities that are most reluctant. And now you're saying you're fired unless you take it. Really? That's the way you're supposed to bring the country together, Mr. Moderate? That makes no sense to me. It's unforced errors that we're seeing. And I think it all is coming to a head. And I think it's the vaccine, believe it or not, that's doing it. Yeah. And you just kind of wonder, can... They write the ship. Can they move the ship a little more toward the middle? Can they talk about the things that those people who are now keeping their opinions, they keep their opinions to themselves. They're not going to keep their vote to themselves. No, they that's, that's, start? In fact, that's why you got your own show, because you said it in one sentence when I took five minutes to say. <laughs> well, let me give you a plug for that compliment. The President and the Freedom Fighter, it's available now on Amazon. They got some book tour dates coming up as well going to be in Madison, Connecticut. That is Connecticut, right? Uh, tonight in yeah. uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania tomorrow night. More dates at brianquilmead.com. But Brian, Adam, the one date mm. that I like that uh, I'd love for you to come if you're there in Orlando, November 21st, they do all the books on stage, kind of mixes everything. I get the sponsors out of it. You buy a ticket and we talk about the president of freedom fighter, but all the books, Andrew Jackson, Mike, uh, Michael Jackson, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Sam Houston, and then this. So that's probably the most fun I have. Uh, I know you do your own shows all the time, too, but and this is your own show. Hmm. But on stage, November 21st in Orlando is the biggest. Uh, Brian Kilmeade, look forward to doing your show and catching up with you on your end of it as uh, soon as possible. Always a pleasure. And uh, thanks Absolutely. for joining me, my friend. 
And until next time, Sam Kroll for Brian Kilmeade and Gina Grand Bald Brian saying mahalo. Cindy Crawford was born in DeKalb, Illinois, and then she left. Right. <laughs> then she left. Never to be heard from she, again in that town. She was born there, and then she turned 15 and right. a half, and she's never come back again. Right. She now lives in Malibu. So this is really a victory for Malibu, not a victory for DeKalb, Illinois, which they didn't like me saying that when I played the <laughs> University of DeKalb, oh, Illinois. Boy. 